Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, it's not too often you have a meeting of people interested in Antarctic and Arctic fish, so I'm happy to be here. This is what I've got lined up for you today. I'm going to talk uh, first about the fossil fishes of Antarctica because there's been a total faunal change between the Eocene and the present day. Then I'll tell you about the shelf habitats we've got, how unusual the habitat is, and then I'll talk about the notothenioid radiation, especially the adaptive component. Um, the, the title builds this as a, a larger presentation than it is. Uh, the overwhelming emphasis today is going to be on the notothenioids. So Antarctica has always been, uh, you know, it's never been as isolated as it is today. It's always been part of the world landmass as Gondwana since 200 million years ago. And it was united with, you can see, Australia here. And this is the peninsula of India. This, of course, is Africa and South America. And at this time, Antarctica had a freshwater fish fauna. I but probably had a marine fauna, too. And uh, even in the uh, uh, Paleozoic, there are fishes in Antarctica. This is, of course, Mesozoic. If we moved forward to today, or about 80 million years from today, and then took a sequence toward today, we see that, the, that we want to watch a couple things. Antarctica's always been in a south polar position. So the, the thing that made it isolated was the seafloor spreading that carried the other continents north. 80 million years ago, uh, this is Africa Peninsula, India had pulled away. You can see this is Australia right here. It's still connected to Antarctica. This is South America. This would be like South Georgia over in here. Uh, so there really is no uh, circumpolar ocean around Antarctica at this stage. So if we run this little seafloor spreading sequence that goes uh, 10 million years every second, you'll see what happens. Notice that Antarctica really doesn't move much, but everything else pulls to the north. And the key point to emphasize here is that uh, the Drake Passage opens. This is the narrow channel between South America and the Antarctic Peninsula. And then Australia has pulled away. So Antarctica is really isolated now. And it's isolated by, um, well, I'll go into that later. There's a key fossil site indicated by the white arrow here that uh, 40 million years ago, as today, was about 64 degrees south latitude. It's called Seymour Island, and this is probably the most important fossil site, one of the most important fossil sites in the southern hemisphere, and the most, and one of the very few fossil sites for Antarctic fishes. It, I've never set foot on it, but early in the game, <laughs> I've come close to it in a ship, and I'm not a paleontologist, but early in the game, Lance Grande and I got a load of trash fossils from paleontologists who were working there looking for the first mammal, uh, and they, which they found. So we got a bunch of junk, basically. Uh, but the interesting thing about Seymour Island is that uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, thought to be now a fully marine deposit of what was around this part of Antarctica 40 million years ago. So this would be a summary of what we have at that time. And this isn't a fauna that lived together simultaneously. This is a panorama of everything that lived there that we have a fossil of throughout the Eocene. So this is a, a huge panoramic view. This is not a, uh, you know, a, a, a constricted fauna that lived together. And you can see that the, it's, it's fairly diverse in terms of higher level taxa. There are lots of uh, cartilaginous fishes. Seems to have gone out. That's all right. I have my own. Thank you. Uh, over here. And then these are bony fishes over here. And what we can say is that in modern Antarctica, there are very few cartilaginous fishes. Here are herrings, catfishes, got gadiforms, uh, wrasses, possibly a notothenioid, lots of other, including extinct uh, family of bill fishes. So it was a a diverse fauna. It was obviously it was a very rich ecosystem to support all these sharks. Uh, sort of unlike the situation today. And during the Eocene, the stable isotope information from 
Do I lose sound? That's back? Okay. Uh, tells us that the temperature cooled during the Eocene from about 15 to 5. So this was a time when the temperature was falling. The sharks were sort of disappearing through the Eocene. Most of the other things lasted to near the end. Whether or not there was a notothenioid is sort of questionable. Our moderator has been a participant recently in many expeditions to Seymour Island. The diversity has only increased from the diversity I showed you in that previous slide. Much of the material brought back recently is otolithic material, especially from gadiforms, which are cod-like fishes well represented in the north. And based on this, uh, you know, roughly 30 new species were described. So there are now about 70 taxa known from Antarctica. So these were all, they were families that were, had a wide distribution then, but the species represented on Seymour Island were probably endemic to that area the time, at the time. This is the, the thing that Lance Grandy and I described as we just didn't know what it was. There just wasn't enough information. It's a dorsal uh, teleos skull. We thought that some of the occipital region looked like that seen in gadiform, so we described it as just a gadiform. And Belushkin, a Russian ichthyologist, came along later and named it as a primitive notothenioid based on what I don't know. I read the paper and I really can't tell. There's nothing osteological that is diagnostic of notothenioids. So this is a, one of those judgment calls. The bad thing about having it um, as, as a notothenioid is that people who do molecular work want to calibrate their dates based on this fossil, whether it, you know, they want it to be a notothenioid. And they also calibrate it wrong in that the we thought it was about a 40 million year old. The new dating shows that it's 50 million years old. So this, this is what we have for a notothenioid. To my mind and eye now, there's still nothing that makes it a notothenioid. It just, you know, it it's, could be a, a gadiform. It could be something else. But that's what we have in the way of a, you know, potential notothenioid fossil. So the point to make about the fossil fauna is that it was uh, temperate, lived in a productive environment, and the higher level taxa were cosmopolitan, found everywhere, although the species were probably unique to the area. And over time, this fauna was replaced. And there was almost no carryover into the modern fauna. The skates could be considered an example of a group that carried over. Whether they really carried over, there were continuous skates in the area, we don't know. It could have been a reinvasion. And we have no idea what a transitional fauna looked like between this fauna and the modern fauna. I mean, it would be naive to think there was nothing. It was probably a mixture of persistent Eocene elements and emerging new elements, including notothenioids. Your guess is as good as mine. But the a period between 40 million years ago and the modern Antarctic environment we see now is anything but a, you know, a a slow cool down. It was just a, a tremendously a dynamic and disruptive time in terms of the shelf, the continental shelves. The first ice shelves are thought to reach the continental margins uh, about 34 million years ago. And it wasn't, you know, there wasn't continuous cool icy weather since then. There were just periods of fluctuation. Uh, there were increases in the thickness of ices, many advances onto the ice shelf. The thing that I always think of as, as remarkable is that during the, uh, the Pliocene from five to two million years ago, recent evidence, drilling evidence, indicates there were 38 cycles of waxing and waning of the West Antarctic ice sheet. That's the, the sheet on the peninsula side uh, across the shelf. And there were, you know, there were fishes living through all this. Notothenioids are older, some of them are, than all this, this disruption. And then 10,000 years ago, the ice advanced to the edge of the continental shelf, never around the entire continent. There were always unglaciated areas, but uh, it was just a, it was anything but a, a slow, steady cool down. Uh, the waters required something to prevent fish life from freezing sometime in this you know, date range. That's the estimate. That's when antifreeze. Estimate it was um, based on the, um, um, the sequence, the, the antifreeze of notothenioids is, is a um, 
a glycopeptide, and the ancestral molecule is thought to be a pancreatic trypsinogen. And it's based on the sequence of divergence from the ancestral molecule. This is the age estimate. This is a sort of unique view of Antarctica, but it emphasizes the thing that makes it different from the Arctic. It's isolated, there's, and the, it's isolated by a variety of things, uh, just distance, water depth, three to 5,000 meters, the currents, patterns clockwise around the continent, and low temperatures, completely opposite of the Arctic where you've got open communication with the North Atlantic and North Pacific. The Antarctic region is usually defined by the southern or be the, actually be the, yeah, the southern boundary of the Antarctic, Antarctic polar front. So this would be the Antarctic region south of this area. This is the Antarctic circumpolar current that is clockwise around the continent. The temperatures drop rapidly across the Antarctic polar front. One time in a ship, I kept track of it. I was just, you wonder if these charts are accurate. Uh, you know, the, the shelf temperatures are minus two here, minus two degrees centigrade, and there's a rapid drop. What I found just watching, you know, a modern ship has all the readouts in every room, every lab on the ship. Over five hours, we spanned at about a degree of latitude, 56 nautical miles, 104 kilometers, and the temperature increased from minus seven to about plus three. We were right in here when this happened. So there is a fairly rapid temperature change, and this uh, excludes entry from most temperate fishes into the Antarctic region. I graphed this to show you the differences between the highest latitude localities and, uh, say, a place like uh, the Falkland Islands, which is cool temperate. So this would be cool temperate. This would be McMurdo, as cold as it gets. Freezing point of seawater is minus 1.86 degrees centigrade. And then these are other stations that are north of McMurdo. These, here's South Georgia. Signy is in the South Orkney Islands. Ryder Bay is a British station about halfway down the peninsula. Notice that the annual fluctuation is greatly damped as we move south. And there's very little change in temperature, but this was done in the days when somebody would go out every day and put a thermometer in and take it out. Now we've got moored current meter and current and temperature meters that you can leave in place for a year. And we now know that during the middle of the summer that the temperature will spike in quotation marks to as warm as minus six degrees in McMurdo Sound. There will be pulses of warm water that come in. They might last for a few hours, they might last for a couple of weeks. It's probably biologically insignificant. It's not warm enough to melt the ice that antifreeze-bearing fish live with. It melts at a higher temperature than that. Um, the, while there isn't much of a, a, a seasonal shift in temperature, productivity and light, of course, are much more remarkable in their variation. What happens to the, th uh, there isn't really much of a thermocline, there isn't really much of a turnover in that far south. So, so this temperature is actually related to that? No, the bottom water would be warmer. It would, the, the current, is, the, the water is pretty well mixed by the currents, and ice is found to down to about 300 meters. Uh, they're somewhat warmer at the bottom, though. And I, I don't know if there's an annual turnover that's never, it's not something that's talked about much. This is what the bottom looks like uh, in, in about five meters of water at McMurdo Sound. Ice is found on the bottom to a depth of about 33 meters. The, uh, there's a slight freezing point in a, dep a freezing point depression. Every 10 meters in depth, I think the freezing point depression is 0 0.0075 um, degrees centigrade, so below that the water doesn't, below, below about 33 meters, ice doesn't form on the bottom. There's a little ecosystem in the sub-ice platelet layer. Um, fish are found among here. Uh, it's possible for invertebrates and fish to be frozen into the ice. It's possible in very shallow water for ice to freeze all the way to the bottom and then to ablate from the top with time. 
The modern shelf and slope fauna is about 279 species. I just counted them up again. I'll show you what they are. Uh, the endemism is extremely high, about 97% for species and about 75% for genera. And it's dominated by three groups, the notothenioids, snailfish, and eel pouts. Uh, you could think of, you know, it, it seems like if it's 10% of the world, if the Antarctic Ocean is 10% of the world ocean, um, and it really only has about 1% of the fish fauna, so it, you could think of it as, as under faunaed. But given the severity of the habitat and the, the, some of the limited features I'll talk about, um, it's amazing there are as many as there are. This is the, what we would find on the shelf. It's ignoring things off the shelf. So there's an oceanic uh, pelagic fauna that's different than this and that consists of groups like mictophids that would be found everywhere. They live in waters that aren't at sub-zero temperature. But this is the composition of the fishes on the shelf. And you can see that it's dominated by just these three groups. There is a representation. We do have hag, uh, hagfish in the Antarctic. We do have lampreys also. That's very far north at South Georgia. Skates get into McMurdo Sound. But you can see there's some cods. There about 6% of the fauna consists of various gadded groups with the asterisks here. But most of the, the species are notothenioids, followed by snailfishes and zoarsid, 88% of the fauna. But notothenioids, if we looked at Biomass and abundance in notothenioids far outstrip everything else. About these are some trawls we did in the, in the raw sea, which would be you know it's about as high as you could go in a ship or high latitude as you could go in the Antarctic. Uh, about 70 cent, 76 percent of the species were notothenioids, 91 percent abundance number of individuals, and about 91 percent by weight. So they are there's no other marine habitat probably that has this level of dominance by a single group. We must, if we're in this museum, it would be a shame not to mention the contributions that were made. Sweden got to the Antarctic early, probably only second or third after the Brits, and they went to the peninsula in South Georgia early. Um, when they, they was, in spite of all the difficulties they encountered, their ship, the Antarctic, was crushed in ice. Uh, some of the crew had to winter over on Seymour Island. They may have collected some of the first fossils. Um, and, but they brought back a tremendous number of fish. In fact, uh, I just counted this up for the, the fort, about 10% of the modern notothenioid fauna was described by Lone Bear and Nibelin. And they did it right. Uh, only two of these, I haven't listed them here, were were placed in synonymy. And in addition, Lone Bear described another dozen or so non-notothenioids. And this was all done in spite of the fact that some of the fish were in the ship were lost. Uh, and <laughs> this, this shows you why th these are Lohnberg's words in the uh, introduction to his paper that Bo showed us. We just used a common sense approach, and it just, they're just as good today as they were then. Unfortunately, we have no morphological definition for notothenioids. I'm an anatomist. I've spent my whole career working on them. I couldn't find anything. I looked at a lot of unusual systems, nervous systems, special sense organs, hoping to find that, you know, something that set them apart. They're diagnosed by this extremely generalized set of characters that are supposedly unique in combination. That's what, but the molecular phylogenies all show a monophyletic notothenoidei. Um, there are several from several different labs. Tom Neer, who was a speaker here a couple of years ago at your Genes and Fish Symposium, has the best notothenoid database. He has about 80% coverage of the species. And his latest cladogram shows something very interesting. Not only do they show notothenioids as monophyletic, but for the first time, the three dominant elements of the Antarctic fish fauna are together in a clade that um, 
veneer calls percaformes. So this is a much reduced percaformes. The old percaformes had about a third of all bony fishes, you know, 10,000 some species. I don't know how many thousand this new group has, but it also includes zoarsids. And for the first time, liparids. Liparids have been traditionally considered scorpiniform. So now they're percaformes. And it's um, and it also near this latest cladogram also included percophis as the phylogenetically basal notothenioid, which is a previously it was a, a bimbrop, and you, these names probably mean nothing to you, but it, uh, Mir did a good job. He's he's been increasing his um, uh, southern hemisphere marine percoform database with the hope of picking up something. And this 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 I made just before I left. This is the state of affairs as we sit here today. We've got 142 notothenioid species, 111 Antarctic, 31 non-Antarctic. The non-Antarctic are the phytogenetically basal. They're shown here in red. These are the Antarctic notothenioids. The wedge is proportional to the number of species. These are some of the features that define the various clades. They, this group has no swim bladder. And we see a light skeleton kicking in with the Antarctic species. All the Antarctic species have antifreeze. Excuse me. The light skeleton kicks in with the Antarctic species plus a Falkland Islands uh, sister group. And then this is the Kianic, the, the group without hemoglobin. Near and uh, 10 other people, including me, put our heads together to try to figure out a lot of people who can these days who get their hands on a little bit of uh, notothenioid DNA want to um, try to to uh, explain the nature of the radiation using you know their information from DNA, and they always invoke antifreeze as a key adaptation. And there's no doubt antifreeze is necessary for fish life in, in notothenioid life in Antarctica, but it. To the way we see it, antifreeze is much older than most of the diversification, most of the bursts of diversification in notothenioid. So this is the age interval of the appearance of antifreeze versus the oxygen isotope curve. Higher numbers mean colder water, and this is a you know a time span through the Cenozoic. So the antifreeze appeared first and early. But most of the bursts of diversification occurred much later, you know, between 15 and 10 million years ago. And some of them were as early as, or recent as about a million years ago. So these are the three big bursts here. And this is the initial uh, age origin of antifreeze. Some of the early, there were the early appearing species were the ones I'm going to talk about um, today. These are the ages of some of the early appearing species. The toothfish are 22 to 14, their estimated age of appearance, 22 to 14. Another fish I'll talk about, Pleurogramma, 20 to 12. And then the rest of the fauna is very young. So about 60% of the modern fauna appeared during these three bursts, but the most morphological and ecological diversity appeared early prior to these bursts. What is notothenioid life like? I guess we could say they're basically sedentary. Uh, cameras have been trained on two species for long periods, and they, they show very little activity. The heart rate for a toothfish at uh, Signy Station, a British station halfway down the peninsula, was six beats per minute. I personally have observed digestion in captivity, where one fish in your tank eats another one, and the tail usually hangs out for several days. So a big uh, kianic that ice fish that eats another big ice fish could spend 10 days or so digesting it. Uh, they all swim with drag-based lagomorphic locomotion using their pectoral fins to pull them through the water. There's no filter feeding. Uh, there's little sustained swimming. They all have antifreeze, but the antifreeze doesn't prevent ice formation. It just prevents ice crystal formation in the body from growing to a damaging size where it would block the capillaries, which are about 10 micrometers in diameter in fishes. 
and some of them have considerable tolerance of hydrostatic pressure, and we have no, there's been no study of their, of, you know, their adaptations to pressure. This is the uh, uh, sort of schematic of McMurdo's sounds showing one family and the morphological diversity we have in this particular family. If we consider notothenioids of radiation, the axes of the radiation are body size, depth, and buoyancy, even though they don't have a swim bladder. There's a 22-fold size range difference in this particular family uh, from the two fish down to smaller individuals. Uh, the depth ranges from 0 to 3,000 meters, and the buoyancy ranges from heavy bottom fish to fish that are at least temporally or uh, neutrally buoyant through part of their life cycles, and one of them maybe is neutrally buoyant permanently. And this, uh, this would give you one idea of the axes of diversification. This is size. These are the toothfishes up here at two meters, and these are intertidal forms at seven centimeters. This is a sort of a, this is a, phylo, a phylogeny, a phylogeny increase. These are phylogenetically derived species up here. These are phylogenetically basal species down here. Depth of occurrence from very shallow waters to nearly 3,000 meters, 2,941 to be exact. Most species in the Antarctic are found at between seven and 900 meters. The shelves are deepened by the isostatic depression. The ice sheet weighs down the continental shelf. So in most continents, the continental shelf is 120 meters. In the sub-Antarctic, it's about 300 meters. In the Antarctic, it's five to 700 meters. And the fish live deeply based on that. And then buoyancy. Even though they don't have a swim bladder, some species are less dense than seawater, and three are neutrally buoyant. One species of toothfish, Disosticus mossini, Pleurogramma antarcticum, another fish I'll talk about, uh, and Ethotaxis. Most fishes are in the two to three to four range. They are able to move up off the bottom to feed in the water column. Do I have much time left? 15? OK. I want to show you some buoyancy measurements, what buoyancy looks, looks like when you, when you measure it in two different species. And so I'm going to use these two species. They're common in the Arctic Peninsula. They're sister species, each other's closest relatives. This one is obviously um, sort of a, more of an active form. It's colored like a water column species. This one is heavy and benthic. This one, we were swimming in a flume in the ship. These are both from South Georgia. This one is, we, actually, this one is from Bouvetoya. I was living in a, uh, kelp. It's heavy and benthic. It was eating kelp in the contained uh, amphipod fauna. This is derived from a larva that looks like this. As far as we know, all Antarctic fish have pelagic, silvery, actively swimming larvae. We had this one in a tank on the ship, and we were swimming against the current, and it can swim like a trooper. And that, these things ca uh, can be widely dispersed by the current. It's p some of them, uh, ice fishes, for example, have larvae that can live for several years as larvae, and they can be spun three quarters of the way around the continent in less than a year. So Antarctic fishes are, the, the genetics isn't as, they're more mixed than you might expect they would be given the distance involved because of the populations are continually being referred to magic larvae. So this is by a buoyancy, so th this is what a series of buoyancy measurements look like for these two species. These are individual valleys we had over 100, or nearly 100 for this one, and well over 100, on a scale from 3 to 5. And the buoyancy measurement is simple. It's something you could do on a ship if things are right. It's, it's not a measurement of buoyancy. It's just a relative weight measurement. It's the weight of the fish or mass of the fish in water divided by its weight in air times 100. And the closer this number is to 0, the closer the fish is to neutral buoyancy. So that is the measurement that's, it's, so it's not a measurement of buoyancy, it's a measurement of, of relative weight. 
and this is what the measurements look like. So this was, these are 95% confidence intervals. So they're about a half of a buoyancy unit different between the mean here and the mean here. So this is a much lighter fish. And I also determined the weight of the skeletons. And this skeleton was significantly lighter than this one in a whole series of fishes. So that, that's what buoyancy measures, uh, measurements look like. It's a sloppy measurement because it, it's, you're measuring not only the weight, but the fish, the different state of its digestive system. Maybe it's full, maybe it isn't. The reproductive state, maybe it has ripe ovaries, which contribute you know, to buoyancy. So it, you know, it's, it's, it's not a clean measurement. So you'd expect scatter like you see here. And there's also an ontogenetic change in buoyancy. So the relative buoyancy measurement, if it's, it's, it, it, the fish is heavy if the number is high, and it's, it's light if the number is low. So they start off larval life as pelagic, so they're not very heavy, they're sort of buoyant. And as they grow, musculoskeletal growth increases, but then as they, and they, they get heavier, but then as they, as they start to, as growth starts to taper off and visceral growth, especially gonadal growth, outstrips musculoskeletal growth, may become somewhat lighter, so you get this sort of U-shaped curve. Uh, so it, buoyancy would vary throughout the, the life cycle of a fish, even if it, it doesn't have any lipid involved in making it less buoyant. So if we took a, a look at the, the uh, components of a fish body that determine its overall density, we'd really see that there's only one thing that's less dense than seawater, and that's lipids of various sorts. Um, Triglycerides are the typical fish lipid, but for some fish uses less dense wax esters. Um, the thing that really contributes to weight is the hydroxyapatite, the bone mineral in all vertebrates. And you can see that cartilage is less dense than bone. So if cartilage can be substituted for bone, the buoyancy can increase somewhat. So in order to become neutrally a buoyant, uh, evolution would have to sort of jigger these things around to either inc increase fat or decrease bone or both, or substitute cartilage for bone. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of skeletal reduction involving just the uh, yeah, minimal ossification of the skeleton and persistent cartilage. And the buoyancy in this case will be between 1 and 2 percent versus skeletal reduction plus the addition of lipid to the body, which produces near or near neutral buoyancy. And if we'd looked at the buoyancy of all notothenioids that I've done to date, I've done 62 species or 62 individuals representing 23 species. And we have very few that are neutrally buoyant, as you can see down here. Let's see, where are we? No, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at, I'm sorry, I'm looking at skeletal mass. I've, I've weighed the skeletons of 23 species. And I can't see this very well. Yeah, dry skeletal mass, okay. And you can see that, that for the non-notothenioids, typical non-notothenioids have a skeleton that's usually between 4 to 5 percent of their body weight. Most notothenioids fall in the 2 to 3 percent, including Elegonops, which is a non-Antarctic notothenioid in the sister group of the Antarctic species. And then these species that are very light and buoyant have a skeletal weight of only about 1 percent of their body mass. And if you put these fish in a CAT scanner and assign red to as the density of hydroxyapatite and look at a non-Antarctic notothenioid. It's ossified like any typical fish with uh, heavy bones throughout the body as indicated by the red. But if we looked at an Antarctic chionicthid, one of the hemoglobinless fishes, which has a light skeleton but no fat, you can see that the densest bone is confined to the sort of the stress points of the skeleton, the jaws, uh, this is the, these are the pectoral, these are the pelvic fin rays, some of the clithral bones, a couple of uh, opercular bones. So that would be an example of skeletal reduction. What you're not seeing here is the cartilage. These are just sheathing bones. 
so this, this, is, this is what these two fish look like. This is Bovictus, which is a typical tide pool, non-Antarctic fish. It's heavy and not buoyant. And this is the, one of the larger of the ice fishes. This particular one just happened to have a meal of another ice fish. This is a pregnant female. These are ovaries. This is the liver. It's sort of, sort of um, it's hard to get the lay of the land of the gut since the liver is light. There's no, you know, these are white-blooded fishes, so the liver is not going to be red. Uh, but this, uh, th this fish is, um, has mostly a cartilaginous skeleton. This is what you, this, look at the ventral part of the neurocranium, and you can see that this is, this ethmoid area is almost solid cartilage. When I was cleaning this off, this sheathing bone came off. This is the parasphenoid, which is just a thin, papery coating on a car, basically a chondrocranium. And if you cut a histological section, this is all cartilage. This is pectoral girdle, this is skull. And the only bone growth is at the periphery, so it's a strictly appositional growth. There's no interstitial growth here of bone because it's just cartilage. Now let's take a look at neutral buoyancy in two cl closely related Antarctic species, which are key to the ecosystem in uh, the Ross Sea and other areas as well. The first one will be the toothfish, Disosticus mossidae. It's one of the two largest Antarctic fish. This one isn't friendly. It's uh, in that goofy stage recovering from an anesthesia. It's just been bled and it hasn't recovered yet. Uh, it, you can see it's scarred up by the long line in which it's been caught. It's just a, you know, it's basically fishing through an ice hole. These reach a large size. And these are all buoyancy measurements that have ever been made on Antarctic toothfish. The, uh, the Americans can only catch these in McMurdo Sound by fishing through ice holes. Um, so we have access to just that population. And the population from McMurdo Sound uh, most of the, spe the average length of the specimens is about 127 centimeters, and most of these are neutrally buoyant. They have no weight in water, and they have quite a bit of fat that I'll show you shortly. And we just have no way of catching any smaller specimens. Later this morning, Dr. Hanschett will be telling you more about the life cycle of Dysosticus out north of the Ross Sea. Um, and where they probably breed as well. But we are able to catch small ones in the Antarctic Peninsula using a bottom trawl. And these small ones are not neutrally buoyant. And you can see they do become more buoyant as they get larger, but they're nowhere near neutrally buoyant. So it's possible that this population in McMurdo Sound is uh, sort of an anomaly. And they're only neutrally buoyant because they have a fat, high fat diet. We know what they feed on there. Dr. Hansett knows more about the life cycle three minutes than I do. But I'll just briefly show you small tooth fish. These are larvae. This one we caught by the, these are from our, the Camelar expedition in the Ross Sea. This is one from um, the South Sandwich Islands. This is one I've been reviewing. Uh, 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 there are people who are studying crab invasions in the Antarctic via camera, towed behind a ship, and they get a lot of bycatch of toothfish. This is there are all sorts of small tooth living, small tooth fish living on the bottom in the peninsula. This one I was reviewing fish this summer for a Japanese movie company. They sent a submersible down with two people at about. 400 meters off the peninsula, and the submersible came down. This was a movie, so this, I took these still shots from the movie, and nothing was visible, and there was a little bit of silt coming up off the bottom. This toothfish was living under this rock ledge, and it's the best example of an Antarctic toothfish uh, underwater that I've ever seen. And it turned around, went back happy as a clam, living not anywhere near neutral buoyancy. Antarctic toothfish have a very light skeleton, a lot of cartilage in the skull, 
in the girdle. The bone is very cancellous, not at all dense. They swim with their pectoral fins. Red muscle is confined to them. They're very energy efficient, stroking their way through the water. And incredibly good blood supply to the white muscle. Tremendous amount of fat beneath the skin. And if you stain with a fat stain, you get something like this. There's fat cells around every single fat fiber. And the, about 10% of the body weight is fat, and it's all triacylglycerols. And I'm really not going to have time to get to all the rest of this. Here's the, another neutrally buoyant species. Different method of... Uh, it has a persistent notochord. Here's the notochord. There's the bone. This is notochordal vacuoles, very undense compared to compact bone. These are big lipid sacs. Here's the lipid sac stain. They're so big you can see them with a x-ray or a radiograph. They're about two millimeters in diameter. And the lipid in this fish increases as it grows, lipid content. The sacs have a very unusual ultrastructural feature and I think I'll just end it there. So we have an example of faunal change where a diverse fauna over tens of millions of years was replaced by a, a fauna that was a, basically a bottom group that managed to fill a number of niches, including neutral buoyancy niches. I think what this tells me more than anything else, there's nothing special about nodothenioids. It's the sort of the percomorph group that has this adaptive capability. That's why 10,000 of the 30,000 species of fish are percomorphs. Thanks a lot for your attention. <clears throat>